of progress. I'm Tori Bedford. Tonight on Greater Boston, microplastics are found in our drinking water, food, and our bodies. A local doctor joins us on the potential dangers for human health and what we can do to protect ourselves and our environment. Then the man behind GBH's curiosity desk, Edgar B. Herwick III, joins me on the official start of spring. And finally, Grace to loosen on how a green station wagon helped her immigrant family feel at home in her story from the stage. It would be an understatement to say that plastic is everywhere. Our water bottles, grocery bags, toothpaste tubes, and the packaging that covers nearly everything we buy. It also ends up in the ocean, foods, and our bodies in the form of microplastics. That's something local doctor Philip Landrigan warns could be even worse for our health than we realize, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine that inaction is no longer an option. Landrigan is the director of the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good at Boston College. He joins me now along with Kirsty Petchy, executive director of Just Zero. Thank you both so much for being here. So we've all seen the clips of the turtles with the plastic straws stuck in their noses and the beaches littered with plastic bottles. Um, I want to play this clip of six-year-old Bella explaining the issue in the 2019 Frontline PBS docu documentary, The Plastic Problem. Plastic gets into the ocean and then fishies eat it and then um, they get sick. So I felt that she kind of summed it up pretty well, but I imagine that you both have more to add. Kirstie, um, can, you, can you explain? I mean, it's not just in the fish, in the water supply, it's in the air as well. How pervasive is this problem and what are microplastics? So unfortunately, because plastic is the petroleum industry's plan B, and because plastic is very, very toxic, it takes chemicals to make plastic, um, we have microplastics everywhere now. Clothes are now, our textiles are about 60%, two thirds plastic. So micro, uh, microplastics, very small bits of plastic, which is how plastic breaks down, uh, are in the air from our dryers, in the water from our wash. Uh, and then our food is so pervasively uh, packaged in plastic that we're seeing bits of plastic in our drinks, in our food that are packaged in plastic. Because the way that plastic breaks down is that it breaks down into these tiny, tiny, minuscule little pieces and those get everywhere into the fish, into everything else. Um, this 2016 World Economic Forum report showed that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans by weight than fish. And so we know it gets into the fish and then we eat the fish, but what do we know generally about the effect on, on people who eat the fish? I don't know if you eat fish still. We, but I, I love fish. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and microplastics in the ocean get into fish, and when we eat fish, those microplastics get into us, and, and they accumulate in our body. And, and, and they have been detected now in many tissues, in colon, in lung, in arteries, uh, in the placenta, in pregnant women. Wow. And so what do we know in terms of research, and it, perhaps there just isn't enough research, about how that happens and what the actual health effects are on people? You said you eat fish. Yeah. I mean, if it's already in the water supply, in the air, I guess you might as well enjoy fish, right? But and, what is the actual impact on, on us? Sure, and there's lots of health benefits to eating fish, and because I live in New England, I love New England fish. But, but the, um, the plastics in the fish are, are a hazard. And up until recently, people would say, well, the plastics are in there, and, and the microplastics get into our bodies, but there's no evidence of harm. Well, the paper that came out this week in the New England Journal of Medicine changes all that because this important paper, which was done by a team of scientists in Italy, examined the carotid arteries of patients with, uh, with heart disease, and they found that people who had microplastics in their carotid artery, in their neck, were 4.5 times more likely to have a heart attack, a stroke, or to die over the next three years. So that's the first paper that I know of, the first report, that microplastics in the human body actually cause disease and death. Wow. But that's the first report, and obviously there's more research coming, I would hope. I think there'll be a lot of research coming. I think it will come quickly. Um, I'm sure some people, for example, the plastics industry will say one paper doesn't prove anything. Mm. I agree, it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it sends a strong signal, a signal that can't be ignored, and now more research is needed. Well, speaking of the plastics industry, and you talked about petroleum, um, 
I was wondering about how we got here. I think uh, generally, you know, our addiction to plastics kind of began after World War II. We had been told during wartime to scrimp and save and reuse everything. And then this manufacturing boom happened and continued. And we wanted to play a couple of clips of, of advertising then and yeah. more recently. The ingenious alchemy of coal and oil provides the material. Ingenious machinery presses and stamps and molds the material into a wide variety of products, articles for household use, as well as tools for industry. Today, there are materials that help lock out harmful contaminants and reduce spoilage, keeping us safe and the food we eat fresh. Plastics make it possible. So plastics make it possible. I mean, there's a strong lobbying effort here as well, Kirsty. Yeah, the, we didn't choose this, and that's a misnomer. We, the, this was foisted upon us. This is this is a choice that the petroleum industry has made to sell a product. If you can sell a single-use product, you can sell it over and over again, or a product in single-use packaging. So the the rise of plastic cups and our and our beverages sold in plastic bottles. And all the plastic packaging that we see, you can't buy food now without it being in plastic. That's not a choice. That's the that's the we're seeing the subsidies to the petrochemical industry and the petrochemical industry power at play there. So um, the other thing to remember about this is while the uh, while the plastic industry will say, well, this is one study, and Dr. Landrigan is totally right about this. This is this is the cusp of a whole wave of studies that we're going to see. In my opinion. While that's correct, that this is just one study, we know already that plastic pollutes at every stage of its production, use, and disposal or recycling. In other words, fracking is very toxic. Uh, the chemical spills when, when uh, you know, like in uh, East Palestine, when the train derailment happened, those chemicals are used to make plastic that that, that derailment uh, uh, can, the train contained. The manufacturing, the crackers, um, the use, there's not only just microplastics, the chemicals are leaching into the food and drink you eat too. So that's not just the bits of plastic, that's actually the chemicals from plastic too. And then finally, we have five incinerators in Massachusetts that burn about 450,000 tons of plastic each year. And that the chemicals from that, uh, those incinerators and that burning are horrifically dangerous. So again, we knew plastic was bad already. This is just another nail in the coffin, quite literally. And you mentioned that plastic production is consistently, continues to be on the rise in your, in your editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's right, 99% of plastic comes from fossil carbon. It comes from gas, it comes from oil, it comes from coal. It's grown 200 times since the end of World War II. It's on track, production is on track to double by 2040. It's on track to triple by 2060. Uh, if that, if we can't bend that curve, the world will be awash in plastics. It already is, and it'll be, it will be inundated in plastics by 2060 unless, unless we can find a way to cap plastic production. And there are some international efforts towards that. You, you mentioned a, a UN treaty that got together in 2022, and they'll be meeting in April to kind of get together and kind of hammer out what they'll be doing. Can you talk a little bit about what their goal is and what kind of opposition they've faced? Sure. So I'm very optimistic about this. In, in 2022, the UN Environment Assembly, which is a, a gathering of uh, people from almost 200 countries, came together, passed a resolution that the world needed a plastic treaty. The goal of the treaty is to end plastic pollution. And the negotiators have met three times so far. They're scheduled to meet again at the end of April in, in Ottawa. And um, people like myself in the public health community are saying that the only rational way to control plastic pollution and control the diseases it causes is to put a global cap on plastic production, similar to the cap on CO2 production that was agreed to under the Paris climate agreement. Now, of course, the petrochemical industry is pushing back. What they're saying is we need more recycling. Mm. Well, I love recycling, but plastic recycling is a scam. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to ask. It's a scam. Uh, abs well, yeah. <laughs> the plastic recycling is a scam. There's a lot there. Kirstie, uh, you had referenced in a Just Zero blog post this Guardian report from 2023 that found that um, this international team of scientists found that uh, microplastics released in the water 
uh, amounted to 13% of the plastic processed in this recycling plant in the UK. And that recycling facility could be releasing up to 75 billion particles in each cubic meter of wastewater. So recycling is also a massive contributor to the amount of microplastics in the system as well. I mean, that's obviously, you know, when people are looking for solutions, they immediately go towards recycling, right? But that may not be the best or most efficient path forward. That's correct. That's correct. That's part of the story we were told, that we were sold. Um, plastic recycling is mechanical plastic recycling, you know, chopping it up and making it into a new product is releases a tremendous amount of microplastics, as you just explained so well. Uh, not only that, but most plastic is not going to get recycled. Just because something can be recycled in a lab doesn't mean that it's going to be sorted, uh, driven, you know, driven somewhere, and then have value. Um, most of these plastics are a mix of different plastics. There's a cap on your carton and the carton is lined with plastic. That's never going to get recycled. So it's very important to differentiate between something that's technically recyclable in a lab and as you said, is very toxic to recycle versus uh, versus something that's just never going to get recycled. Uh, so, you know, those are there's a, there's layers there. What what solutions are being put forward that you see as as effective? Well, we, we know that certain plastics are so toxic and really can be replaced so easily that they should be out immediately. Polystyrene, styrene, it's it's a, a resin number seven, uh, number six, excuse me. That's been banned in many uh, communities across Massachusetts and in, in states. So we need to pass a polystyrene ban across the board in Massachusetts. Um, we also know that we want our food and beverages to be packaged in reusable, refillable systems in glass. So one step to get to that would be a deposit return system, a bottle bill expansion in Massachusetts. That would mean that there'd be sorting of our beverage containers and eventually refill of our beverage containers in good, clean glass. That's the best way to have your beverage delivered to you by a corporation. Um, and then also, you know, bands are one idea. Systems for refill and reuse are another idea that work. They work really. Both of those things work really, really well. But we also know that we have to be realistic about um, actually closing the loop. And when you're going to be recycling something that's endlessly recyclable like glass or metal, that's fine. But just to acknowledge that plastic is not recyclable and to treat it as a toxic material that we should be phasing out as quickly as possible. So I wanted to really quickly, we don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to ask you both about some items that might be sinister and perhaps the, rate them on dangerousness in my single-use plastic bag, which is reusable. I've got a soda, um, some produce here. There's an apple and an orange, which I know can contain microplastics. Uh, beer, we talk about the beer, the fact that it's got microplastics, I guess, in the actual beer is what I read. Floss, toothpaste, wanna make sure you can see these. Mm -hmm. uh, Welsh's snack pack and a lipstick that I used earlier. So first of all, anytime you can be using something that's reusable, truly reusable, not like that bag, but something that you can wash and use over and over again, that's always your best choice and anything that doesn't have plastic in it. So in other words, even if it's possible that that fruit has microplastics in it, um, it's, if it's not wrapped in plastic, if you were able to purchase it without having to put it in a plastic bag or it didn't come in a plastic bag, you're still ahead of the game there, I would say. So much of this plastic is, is completely unnecessary. And it's a new creation, as, as Christy said, it's, it's been foisted upon us. When I was a kid, Coke came in glass bottles. And uh, as children, we used to scrounge those bottles. There was a nickel deposit, you'd bring them back to the store. It was great. This stuff is used once, it's, it's tossed away. And it just fills the landfills, creates microplastics, causes pollution and creates profits for the fossil fuel industry. It's a, it's a right. manufactured addiction. That's right. And the other thing too is there's some sneaky plastic there that you should be aware of. So Coke is an acidic drink. It's probably leaching chemicals into uh, the drink. Also the capping process, there's about an 80, 90% chance that there are microplastics from the capping process in that Coke. So in some ways, the Coke is the worst, I would say. And as the doctor just said, it could very easily be in a glass uh, bottle. So what, you know, uh, then remember that that beer is lined with plastic, that aluminum can. Yeah. So um, you've got plastic there too that could also leach into the beverage. 
uh, which is why to me, glass is king. Mm. The soap, Irish Spring, at least it's in a recyclable, it looks like a cardboard box. But I, you know, there's a lot of soap out there you can buy without a box, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and right now it's just the fancy soaps. You should be able to buy all your soap without a box. So that's where regulation and, um, you know, it's not just on the consumer. We shouldn't have to police ourselves so utterly that, that we can't even, you know, purchase some soap. We should be able to go buy a beverage, buy some soap without having to worry about plastic packaging. Great. Well, Dr. Phil Glandrigan and Kirsty Petchy, thank you both so much for being here. Next, happy first day of spring to those of you who celebrate and follow the astronomical seasonal calendar. Meteorological spring began March 1st, but the start of astronomical spring comes with the vernal equinox, which for us here in the Northern Hemisphere happened last night. Among those excited to usher in the season is Edgar B. Herbick III, the guy behind GBH's Curiosity Desk. Hey, Edgar. Hey, Tori. Happy first day of happy spring. Happy spring. It's spring now, no matter what calendar calendar you follow. Yeah. So I was thinking what we would do is some question and answer fun around the idea of the equinox and the word spring. We'll use it as a springboard into some nice. questions. I see what you did there. Yeah, well, nice. thank you very okay. much. So you're, you're yeah. into this. Let's go. So let's do it. Let's get that first question. This is your first question here. This one is about the equinox. Which of these words is related to equinox? Okay. So you've got A, obnoxious, B, nocturnal, or C, Aquarium, which word is, you know, related a no to the word? Nocturnal? Nocturnal. That would be absolutely <gasps> correct. Yes. You got Let's it. Let's go. Of course. Okay. So equinox, that word equinox comes from Latin, and it means equal night. And so the idea of the equinox, what happens is, essentially, everywhere on the planet, you have almost exactly equal 12 hours of night, 12 hours of day. When we're in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the vernal equinox. We're going into spring, Southern Hemisphere. They're going into fall. But for that one day, almost everybody has the same amount of light and night, equal night. And then nocturnal, that same noct, noct from Latin, that is night. Nocturnal, of course, being related to the night. Cool. So and the people who are nocturnal don't even see the sun, so. That's true. They wouldn't even That's know. true. They yeah. wouldn't even know. All right. Should we do another one? Let's go. Okay, so the spring in this question is the city of Springfield here in Massachusetts. So question number two, true or false on this one? So you got a 50% shot. The Springfield newspaper, The Republican, is older than the Boston Globe. Would you say that is true or false? True. That is true. Oh my God. You, you are too I didn't two. even cheat this time. Yeah, so the, yeah. the Springfield Republican began way back in 1824 as a weekly, then it became a daily in 1844. And, you know, that name Republican and the Republican Party, which was the abolitionist party during the Civil War, they're kind of related. And this newspaper in Springfield was one of those that was really fighting for the abolitionist cause during that period. Another really interesting fact about this newspaper, Charles Dow, who is the founder of the Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal, he started his career as a business reporter for the Springfield Daily Republican. Wow, is that still a back. newspaper? It is still a newspaper. Wow, it that's amazing. It still exists. It's still cool. out there in Springfield, Massachusetts. All right, hit me. Let's, All right, let's we'll do another one. All right, yeah. question number three. Question number three, this, was, this is maybe your toughest one because it's not multiple choice and it's not true and false. You're just going to have to take a guess. Okay, wow. All right, here we go. This book by Rachel Carson is considered by many to be the starting point of the modern environmental movement. I feel like people watching at home are screaming at their TVs, Silent Spring. That would be correct. Yes. You are three for three today. Yes, Let's Silent go. Spring. Uh, the title was actually inspired by uh, a line from a John Keats poem, The Sedge is Withered from the Lake and No Birds Sing. And initially, this was going to be just the title of one of the chapters, the one about bird songs sort of going away. Mm. But eventually they came to go, no, this is kind of metaphorical for the whole thing that this is about. There are also some co local connections with this book, one being that one of the big inspirations for the book to be written was a letter that was written by one of Carson's friends to the Boston Herald describing her property and birds were dying and DDT had been used on the property. And that was a big impetus for Rachel Carson to write the book. And then it was also published by a local firm here in this area, Houghton Mifflin. They were the publisher on that book yeah. all those years ago. So a couple local connections with the book there. That's cool. I didn't know that. There you go. It was a game changer. Yeah. All right, let's do one more. One more. Okay, okay. If you one have more one. question. All right, we'll go back to true and false on this one. So 50% okay. shot of getting it right, which means you will be four for four if you do. No pressure. All right, here we go. A major reason why Boston was established where it is today is thanks to a natural fresh water spring that served as the main source of drinking water for the city for 200 years or so. Please tell me it's not the Charles. 
No, 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 no. no. That, 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 it is not the Charles. <laughs> well, we can say definitively it's not the I mean, that would be cool if people could have drank from the Charles at True. some point. But, but okay, I don't know. Is, was there a freshwater oh, spring? Oh. And is that a large reason why Boston ended up kind of growing as a city where it was? Sure, yeah. yeah. I don't know. True. True. Correct. Oh, my God. Oh, before you did it. Wow. Yeah. In fact, today in downtown Boston, uh, between, I think it's Devonshire Street and Washington Street, there's a little street called Spring Lane, and there's a plaque there that sort of, that, that is the spot where this spring once was. And basically, when the Massachusetts Bay Colony came, there was a guy who was living there, and he sort of had access to this freshwater spring, and they were like, this is good. There's they good named, water here. They named it so after him? That's Shama amazing. Cool. There, okay, you know, where so. can people ask you questions and and where can they send you stuff to find out? It's pretty easy. They can send me an email at curiositydesk at wgbh.org. Ask me your questions. Maybe we'll take on some of them right here on Greater Boston in a future episode. Awesome. All right. Edgar B. Herwick III, thank you so much. Thank you. Finally tonight, the process of becoming a U.S. resident takes many, many years in most cases, and during that time, immigrant applicants can't leave the country. That was the case for Grace Toulousen and her family after they came over from the Philippines when she was just three years old. She looked back on her memories from that time with stories from the stage. We bring you her story now as part of a partnership between that show and this one. My father was the first to arrive in the United States. His plan was to come here and further his medical education and then go back to the Philippines so that he could set himself up well. So he knew he would be gone for a few years, so he sent for my mother, my older sister, and I. We always planned to go back to the Philippines, so my mother um, started uh, collecting gifts to bring back home. She collected bed sheets and towels and even toilet paper because she thought it was just so much softer here than it was back home. But as happens sometimes, you go someplace and that place changes you. So my father started to dream and he started to wonder, what would it be like to stay here? What would our lives look like? What would the lives of his children be like? And so he took a risk and he took the exam for foreign medical graduates and he passed. And all of a sudden, this whole new world and future opened up for him and our family. He opened his own medical practice, hired a staff, um, bought a house in the suburbs and bought his first new car, which was a Chevy Caprice Classic station wagon, turtle green interior and exterior. Um, <laughs> And his idea is that cars are meant to be pragmatic. They should get you from A to B safely. And so one of the first things we did with that car is we drove to visit his brother and sister in Toronto. The family is really important in the Philippines and we didn't have family in Boston. So that was one of the first things we did. So we all piled into the station wagon. We drove to the Canadian border and the border patrol took one look at our um, station wagon, which was piled up with suitcases and our passports, which were just about to expire. And he sent us back. And he, um, I didn't know at that time, but soon after that, we, our status became, um, we became undocumented. Our status became, um, we had overstayed our visas. And my parents hired a lawyer to regulate our papers, but the lawyer didn't help and um, took their money, but it took maybe 15 more years until we were able to fix our status. But I didn't care. I didn't know any of this stuff. I was a kid. I was an American, as all my friends were. I rode in that station wagon to school, to my activities, to band practice, to soccer, and I had no clue that this was all going on. The only difference was that we didn't leave the country. So if there was ever a school vacation, we didn't find us in the Swiss Alps skiing or in Cancun swimming in the winter. We took road trips in that green station wagon. We drove uh, to Florida, we drove to the Midwest, we went all over the South, and we saw how America was made. We looked at the monuments and the battlefields, we went to the White House, we saw what, you know, what America wanted to remember, what they wanted to memorialize, and we visited all those places in that car. Now, my parents didn't want to spend money on fast food, so my mother would bring a rice cooker along on our trips and chicken adobo, and we would have that at the rest stops, and I would look really jealously at the other families who were unwrapping peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and potato chips, and I just thought that was so exotic. <laughs> um. 
They also didn't like to stop very often, and one time I saw them switch drivers without ever stopping the car on the highway. <laughs> My father uh, helped kept his foot on the gas, and he kind of inched his way over to the passenger side. And my mother held on really tightly to the steering wheel and like looked straight ahead until she was able to inch the rest of her body over and then put her foot on the gas. And we all cheered when they did that. It was, it was great. So we visited monuments and battlefields, but my father's favorite thing was to go on a factory tour. First of all, it was usually free admission, and secondly, you would walk away with a parting gift. So we went to the Kellogg's factory, and it smelled so good, the air smelled like corn syrup, and there were these big hot vats of cereal, and I just wanted to put my arm in and take some and eat it, but it was boiling hot, so good thing I didn't do it. Um, we went to the Chevy assembly plant, which was full of metal and really boring. And we went to the U.S. Mint, which we watched money get made, and we dreamed of what we could do with all that money. The one place I remember is the cigarette factory in Richmond, Virginia, and we watched all this messy brown tobacco get packed neatly into, into white cylinders and then get packed into boxes. And that day, every single one of my family members walked away with a free parting gift. I got my first carton of cigarettes at age nine. So we, we finally got our documentation regulated, and my father, this is about 15 years in, and my father was still driving that green station wagon, and my mother felt kind of embarrassed because he was a doctor by now, and he would park in the doctor's parking lot at the hospital amidst all the Audis and Mercedes and BMWs, and he had this ramshackle green station wagon in there. So eventually, he decided it was time to let it go. He thought it had tremendous value, it brought a lot of value to my family, and so he parked it in the front lawn, put a cardboard sign up, and put a price on there. But every week, his heart would be broken. No one wanted it. And so every week, he crossed out that, that number, put a lower number on. Week after week, this happened, until eventually he had to pay somebody $200 <laughs> to come and tow it away. So that green station wagon did more than just bring us all over the United States and bring us to school and work. It was the place where we became American. We learned what it was to become American, and we became that in that car. And it brought us safely from new immigrant to citizen, from alien to belonging, from A to B. Thank you. You can catch more stories from the stage Mondays at 9.30 p.m. on World and Fridays at 8 here on GBH2 or anytime on the Stories from the Stage Facebook page and YouTube channel. And tomorrow you can catch some stories in person at the Stories from the Stage Women in Action event. For tickets and more info, head to gbh.org slash events. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'm Tori Bedford. Good night.